Hey there, dirtbag people. I'm Chuck from True Tech, and today I'm gonna to take you through start to finish on how I rebuild a crankshaft. First of all, there are a whole bunch of different variables. I'm gonna be rebuilding a two-stroke, and they're a little bit different than a four-stroke, but the main concepts are the same. The actual work of pressing the crank apart and then pressing it back together and truing it is relatively straightforward but there are a surprising amount of variables that can come into play. No matter how much experience you have, there is a certain amount of feel that goes into rebuilding a crank. A big part of this is pressing the pins into the crank webs. If something's not quite straight, or if there's too much pressure, or if there's not enough pressure, there's no measuring tool that you can use to learn that stuff. But once you've done a lot of them, you learn to feel what's going on. So I'll take you through this crank rebuild and I'll talk through a lot of those things that require the feel. And I'll do my best to give you an accurate description of what it's like to actually rebuild a crank. So we've got our crankshaft here. This one happens to be out of a 250 TPI, but the concepts are the same for all two stroke single cylinder engines and very similar for four strokes as well. For this rebuild, I'll be using a Prox connecting rod kit, although I don't have any specific preference. I've used hot rods, I've used OEM, I've used Prox a lot, as well as power rods and Wiseco, and I have not seen a pattern of premature failure in any of them. However, as you'll see, there's plenty that can go wrong during installation. The first thing I'm gonna do is get a measurement for the overall crank width. That way, when I press it back together, I know exactly how far to go. Now, I've rebuilt hundreds of these cranks, so I know that usually a KTM is gonna be at about 2.360 inches, but I measure every single one just to make sure that I don't run into an anomaly. On a two-stroke, these little gaps right here allow premix to reach that big end bearing. If the crank gets pressed too tight, you'll side load those thrust washers, and if you don't press it tight enough, then of course the crank won't fit properly between the cases or between the main bearings. On a four-stroke, this thrust clearance is even more critical. On most four-strokes, the crankshaft is the first component in the circuit that receives oil. The oil is fed in through the end and lubricates the big end. If the thrust clearance is too big, then the circuit won't have enough oil pressure. If the thrust clearance is too small, there won't be enough oil flow through the crank. Now, there are several special tools required to rebuild a crank, and this is the first one. This is just a simple plate that holds the crank in place so that I can press the pin out. Once I've got it set up, this part's pretty easy. Now I'll do this real time so you guys get an accurate idea of what it takes to press this pin out. There's quite a bit of pressure. Now the pressure is diminishing as I press and now I can just catch it with my hand. Now all that's left is just to push the pin out of the remaining side. Steering bearing races are very handy for this. Oh, this one's tighter. Ooh. There we go. So this came apart really nicely. There's no galling inside here. It's nice and smooth. I've had KTM cranks in the past that were so tight that when I pushed the pin out, it ruined the web and the pin. Now, of course, you want to check to make sure that your stuffer bolts are all tight and that the crank webs are nice and clean. I went ahead and did all that stuff. I'm sure you guys don't want to see it. We're going to get right on to installing the new pin back into the crank. This part's honestly pretty straightforward. You just want to make sure that your crank web is nice and flat. It's not hanging up on anything and that your pin is getting pushed straight down into the crank. And here's one of those feel things that I was talking about earlier. I put my fingers on each side of the pin as I press to make sure that it's going down evenly. If the crank pin goes in at all sideways, it's going to carve up the crank web and it'll be ruined. Once I get the crank pin started, I take it back out of the press and verify that there's no carving happening. Then I set it back up with a piece of piston ring underneath the crank assembly so that I can just push the pin down and it'll stop instead of going too far. Now we can drop on the first thrust washer, then the new connecting rod along with the new bearing, and then the second thrust washer. Now we're going to set this back up in the press and get it aligned as closely as possible. It doesn't have to be perfect at this point but that second crank web should be nice and flat. Now we're gonna start pressing this on and go about an eighth of an inch. Again, I'm gonna get my fingers in here so that I can feel if it's moving straight or not. Now I'm gonna pull it back out and make sure that it's not carving. If it's carving, you'll see little hairs inside of this hole. Now I'm gonna press it about halfway down and then we'll take it out again and make sure that it's aligned pretty close. I do it this way because oftentimes when you're pressing the crank together, the webs will rotate a little bit. So to make sure that I'm not getting too far off, I use a bearing and I clamp it in the lathe and periodically check the true throughout the pressing process. I do it this way because it's easier to measure the swing of the crank than if I were to hold it in a set of V-blocks. Now to measure what I'm calling the swing on the crank, I'm gonna be placing the big end of the rod at the front and at the back like this. Now in this case, I'm what I call front side high. By that, I mean that when the bearing is at the front side of the lathe, I've got a high measurement. At this point, the crank is moving really easily, so I wanna get it within 10 thou and then I'll keep pressing. Now I'm gonna check the true in the lathe a couple more times before I get my final measurement. And that's going to do two things for me. It's going to make my final true easier. And I'm also going to get a better crank because the less I can move it, 
the better. Now oftentimes getting the final crank width is the most difficult part by far. If you push it too far, then you gotta get your jig back out and pull it back apart. Not only is this time consuming, but every time you move that crank, you're compromising the integrity of that interference fit just a little bit. Now there are different jigs that you can use, or you can use a series of shims if you're careful and if you know what you're doing, but this is by far my favorite way of getting to the final number. As I've been pressing this crank together, I've been paying attention to how much force it takes to get it to move. Now what I'm doing is I'm bringing the crank close to the point where it moves, and then I'm tapping the ram of the press with my hammer, and that vibrates it and then moves it a tiny little bit. I can move cranks one or two thou at a time this way. Now once I've got the final crank width set, I'm going to go back to the lathe and now I'm going to really dial in the swing. I want this within one thou. Now this part here is the tough part. It definitely takes a lot of experience to have the feel, to know how hard to hit it, where to hit it, and even just how to measure it properly. This bearing has a fair bit of play, so it's not just like rotate it here and rotate it there and check the numbers. You got to make sure that everything is settled and there's just no way around it. This is something that takes quite a bit of experience. Oftentimes, to get competent at doing cranks, you're looking at doing a few dozen. Don't think that I'm trying to discourage you though. I've seen lots of guys do a good job on their first attempt. It just takes them several hours. After doing hundreds of cranks, sometimes I can do them in about half an hour, and sometimes it takes me three hours. All right, now that I've got it within a thou, I'm gonna move it over to the V-blocks. At this point, basically, if my dial indicators are showing opposite, I know that my swing is still off. If they're showing the same, it means my webs aren't parallel. In this case, you'll see that they're running opposite. The left one is showing high while the right one is showing low. So while you watch me work on this crank here, there's a few other things that I need to talk about. The first thing is how the crank is supported. I'm holding it in the V-blocks exactly the same way that it's held inside the engine. I see a lot of crank builders holding their cranks between centers and I don't think that this is reasonable at all. If you're rebuilding a crank, you know that someone has used a flywheel puller on it. That flywheel puller completely compromises the reliability of that end. Also, while the engine's running, nothing is touching the end of that shaft. I wanna be holding the crank the way that it's going to be held inside the engine, and I want to be indicating where it matters. Now, in this case, you'll see that my left side indicator is on the threads, and that's not reliable. I'm going to be moving it onto the tapered section, but that is difficult, so I'm using this to get it close. I could be indicating closer to the crank webs, and that would be an easier surface to indicate on, but I don't want to be indicating close to where the bearings are, because the further out I indicate, the more accurate my reading is going to be. I've seen lots of crank builders holding the crank just like this, but then they're indicating right above the V-blocks. I'm really not sure why you would do it that way because it's literally the least accurate way to do it. The further out you can get, the more accurate your reading is gonna be. So if you've been watching up to this point, you'll have noticed that I've moved my indicators around a little bit. I've got the crank really close and I've been banging it around between shots. You'll see I've moved the right side off onto the threads because I'm not too concerned about that anymore. I'm just keeping it there to give me a general idea. I'm looking at the left side and you'll see I've moved it onto the tapered section and I'm just putting a little bit of light pressure on that crank just to hold it in place so it doesn't walk around. And you can see I've still got about three thou to go. At this point, I'm being really careful with my taps here. The movement of the crank doesn't directly correlate with how hard you hit it. Cranks will stick and then once you hit them hard enough they'll kind of jerk and then they'll go too far. There are all kinds of little techniques that I've picked up over the years doing cranks and everybody's got a few of their own unique ones. At the end of the day it's important to narrow it down to two things. You're either going to be out on your swing or the webs are not going to be parallel. Those are the only two things that you can adjust. To adjust the swing I hit the crank with my hammer and if it's not parallel I either spread it with a chisel or I clamp it in the vise to bring it closer together. Now here you can see that I'm checking on that flat surface just to verify that I'm not doing anything wonky and you can see that we're indicating at about half a thou run out. Now when I move it back out towards the end where it should be we're looking at three to four thou. This crank is especially tricky because it's got a taper on the left and a keyway on the right but that's no excuse. Lots of cranks are like this and each one presents its own challenges. Like I said sometimes it takes me half an hour sometimes it takes me three hours. Eventually they all end up like this one. It doesn't always go smoothly and sometimes it feels like you're going backwards and you gotta take a step away for a minute. Personally, it always helps to remember that there's only two ways that it can go wrong. It's either the swing or it's parallel. I hope that helps clarify things. If you found this video helpful, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If you wanna see more content like this, subscribe and hit the notification bell. If you wanna see what I'm doing on a more day-to-day -day basis, you can find that content on Instagram. Thanks a lot for watching.